Good evening, everybody. This is Smiles Lewis with another live streaming event from the Anomaly Archives, the nonprofit lending library and uh, long term archive for the Scientific Anomaly Institute, a 501c3 nonprofit here in Austin, Texas. We've been doing ever since uh, February of this year a series of, uh, well, we started to, to do an in person series, but uh, this little thing called uh, COVID came along and made everything virtual, but that's fine because we can all re we can reach even more people now uh, across the interwebs and we're so glad that you have uh, chosen to join us now live, but uh, we'll also of course feature this, the archive of this on our YouTube channel. And I want to welcome my uh, guests. Uh, I need to excess and Victor Criterion here to uh, yet another episode of the Anomaly Adventure Club, Anomaly Archives Adventure Club meetup. And uh, thank you so much for joining us y'all. Uh, how are you doing this evening? Fantastic. <laughs> so it was it was uh, it was these fine folks, long friends of uh, myself and the Anomaly Archives, who uh, came to me uh, late last year with this idea for doing monthly uh, uh, Anomaly Archives Adventure Club meetups, inspired by their adventures, uh, discovering the uh, the horrible truth behind the uh, famous Adventure Club that uh, it was back in the 1920s and on into uh, the 70s and 80s that produced a pulp magazine uh, chronicling people's adventures around the world. And uh, whoa, what crazy adventures those people had and uh, what great crazy adventures uh, uh, my friends here, uh, I need to, and Victor have uh, to tell us about in their exploration of uh, such a very Halloween themed uh, uh, story, the, the, the origins of one of my favorite horror themes, the, the zombie mythos. And um, so just real briefly, before we start tonight's uh, pre-recorded uh, uh, stream, um, I, I, what, what piqued your interest or what was the spark for this particular uh, research thread? When we were uh, going through the uh, Venture Magazine archives, we found a reference to a Faustin Workus, who was a king of a Caribbean island. And then that led us to Willie Seabrook. And Willie Seabrook sort of stole the show from Faustin. So I've I've heard uh, occasionally the stories of 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 the origins of this uh the, the strange idea of zombies, um, but I, I have a feeling that your your uh, series tonight and that we're also going to show part two on Wednesday night um, is going to go into a, a variety of areas that people are not uh, necessarily familiar with. Uh, uh, so, any any previews before we start the show tonight? Any any tidbits you want to share with our audience? Um. Uh... This will be a presentation about zombies like no other one out there. I can guarantee that. <laughs> um, there's going to be flesh eating. There's going to be fashion um, and so much more. So I uh, uh, encourage you to take a look. All right. Well, uh, without further ado, uh, dim the lights and uh, put on your, uh, your uh, spooky background music and uh, get ready for... Wow, uh, the story of Willie Seabrook and his flesh eating zombies. <laughs> wow, the twisted tale of Willie Seabrook and his flesh eating zombies. A lecture by Anita Excess and Victor Criterion. In today's lecture, we're going to be talking about William Willie Seabrook, a man who was many things, a sensational yellow journalist, an explorer, a writer, an occultist, and a cannibal. He was a popular writer in the 1920s and 30s. He wrote 11 books about his various adventures, and he would be forgotten if it weren't for his time in Haiti, where he stumbled across the concept of zombies. He is credited as the first Western writer to describe Haitian zombies. Well, the zombie concept took off and changed the course of entertainment forever. Oh, and he was the first writer to write about his time in an asylum to cure his alcoholism. His book, Asylum, 
was published the same year that Alcoholics Anonymous was created. The founder of AA, Bill Wilson, was known to have read Willie's book, and the earliest versions of the AA Bible mentioned Willie by name. Willie's life was a journey of success and tragedy. He came from a family of men who threw their careers away to pursue their passions. Willie's grandfather, who was a friend of Abraham Lincoln, threw his career away to tend to his fey young wife, who was very, very strange. Her name was Piney, and she had mystical visions. When Willie was a young boy, he was sent to live with his parents for a time, and he became very close to his grandmother Piney. She had a bit of an opium addiction, and she used to take Willie into the woods where she hid her stash. Willie writes that she introduced him to altered states of consciousness during these visits to the woods, where he would have fantastical visions. But he swears she never gave him opium, just that she was able to create a new reality because of her strange abilities. This exposure to altered states at such a young age was going to mark his journey through life. It created the first of what Willie would call his supreme wants, a tremendous desire in Willie to explore the various ways to get into altered states. Willie's grandfather had thrown away a powerful job as the collector of the port at Baltimore, and now he was the owner of a small county newspaper in Westminster, Maryland. Willie used to hang out in the office and marvel at this man who would write things down on a paper with a feather quill pen and then hand the paper to a team of typesetters who would convert his writings into a newspaper. Willie was particularly taken with the grand steam-powered printing press that majestically turned his grandfather's words into the words that were to be read by the entire county. This, Willie recalled, was the genesis of his second supreme want— and that was to become a writer. Willie's father was being prepared to become a congressman when he heard the calling of God and threw away his political career to become a pastor. This decision meant that the family moved to Kansas during Willie's childhood. His father bought a stereo opticon machine and spent a lot of money on slides to show the Native American scenes from the Bible. Being the child of a pastor, Willie was bored by his father's sermons, but when his grandfather would read the vivid tales of the Old Testament, it created a desire for Willie to find a living religion that practiced altered states. In 1917, Willie got his start as a writer when he was an ambulance driver in World War I. His diary was adapted to a short book about his experience, which included being gassed in Verdun. He was awarded the Croix de Guerre for his injuries. After the war, Willie and his first wife, Katie, moved to Greenwich Village in New York City. Willie became a newspaper writer, and Katie opened a very popular coffee shop in the basement of 156 Waverly Place. It was the kind of place that had no sign or exterior markings. It was more like an insider's club. They met everyone who was someone in Greenwich Village. Nobel Prize-winning author Sinclair Lewis poet and playwright Edna St. Vincent Millay, painter Bob Chandler, puppeteer Tony Sarg, and many others. But one of the more interesting people they met and became friends with was Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley was an occultist, a writer, and a mountaineer. When Willie first met Crowley, Willie thought that he looked like a nursery imp masquerading as Mephistopheles. Crowley was known as the most wicked man in the world, who used to sign his letters with The Beast 666. Throughout his life, Crowley was kicked out of most European countries for running various occultist cults. Crowley once owned a house on the shores of Loch Ness, Boleskine House, where he attempted to perform a lengthy ceremony of Abramelin the Mage. Some believe that he might have conjured the monster from the lake. He was unsuccessful in completing the full ritual. The house was later owned by musician Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin. Sadly, it burned down a few years ago. In the summer of 1920, Willie invited Crowley to his farm outside Atlanta. Crowley spent two months there, which was plenty of time for them to do some experiments. One night, they talked about the vow of silence taken by Trappist monks, and so they decided to do a variant of that by speaking for a week using one prearranged monosyllable. Some of the monosyllables that were rejected were er, woof, moo, 
and ba. The word that they chose was wow. And so they spent an entire week saying nothing but the word wow. Willie and Crowley were amazed at how well they could communicate with different intonations of a single word. Then, one night they drank a gallon of moonshine and had an incredible conversation using the word wow. Willie insisted that he and Crowley held a deep and profound philosophical conversation that lasted for hours. He later wrote about that experience in what he claimed to be his only work of fiction that he sold to a magazine called The Smart Set. The previous summer, Crowley decided to go into the wilderness for 40 days to engage in prayer and meditation. At the time, Crowley didn't have any money, so Willie and Katie gave him cash and a list of provisions that he was going to need, then bought him a canoe and a tent. The next day, they went to see Crowley off and discovered that he had spent the money for food on 50 gallons of red paint. They were beside themselves, and they asked him how he was going to eat. Crowley said, I will be fed as Elijah was fed, by the ravens, and off he went. Somehow, during his 40-day retreat, he convinced the local farmers to feed him while he painted on the cliffs, in gigantic red letters, two enormous sentences, Every man and woman is a star, and do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Willie eventually managed to turn his friendship with Crowley into a lurid 12-part series titled Astounding Secrets of the Devil Worshippers' Mystic Love Cult. It was the tale of Crowley's depraved cult in Sicily, where one of the cultists died supposedly after drinking cat blood in a dark ritual. Crowley's response to the series was mixed. He felt no ill will towards Willie, but he felt that Willie was a backslider on his quest to become a serious writer, and that his story was absurdly incomplete. Finally, Crowley said of Willie, When the facts fail, they must be filled up with fiction, and where they obstructed his wild career, they must be distorted into fantastic form. Willie enjoyed writing newspaper articles for Hearst and King Features Syndicate. He said they wanted good, clear, exciting, vivid writing and were willing to pay for it. And yet Willie knew that his literary friends hated William Randolph Hearst. In fact, there was an office joke about a Hearst writer who said that he had told his mother that he played piano in a brothel instead of writing for Hearst to explain the fat paychecks. During these years in New York City, in Greenwich Village, Willie and Katie were surrounded by sculptors, architects, artists, and writers. Because Willie had once sold his short story, Wow, to the literary magazine The Smart Set, he was usually introduced to members of high society as a short story writer. But the stain of being a writer for Hearst did stick to Willie and showed up in surprising ways. Years later, when Willie was introduced to his favorite writer, Theodore Dreiser, a man who had just missed getting the Nobel Prize in Literature. Willie was introduced as the writer of The Magic Island and Jungle Ways. Dreiser sneered at him and made a cruel comment about yellow journalism. This slight deeply hurt Willie and reinforced the stigma that his time with Hearst had left with him. But when Willie was working for the paper, he enjoyed it thoroughly. He embraced sensationalism and wrote many articles, including one about the bob-haired bandit. The bob-haired bandit was the story of a petite young woman named Cecilia Cooney and her husband, who had committed a series of armed robberies in 1924. The tiny Cecilia had worn a series of bob-haired wigs of different colors and materials, which fired the public's imagination. They were eventually caught after ten robberies and jailed. Willie's boss decided that the paper was going to run ten to twelve installments of her full confession. Her story was the biggest thing in the news at the time. She seemed to be a modern woman who had turned to crime. Every paper was trying to get access to her. Willie was given a roll of hundred-dollar bills and two certified checks to get her story. Willie got into the jail and got Cecilia to sign an exclusive contract. He was going to ghostwrite her confession and generate as much sympathy for her as possible. He needed photographs for the story, 
so he went to Katie's coffee house and got a suitcase full of donated clothes from all the young women who were there. The next morning, he set up a one-woman fashion show in the jail, where Cecilia was photographed in a number of outfits, including one photo that had her in Katie's turban and handcuffs that belonged to Willie's play partner, Deborah Luris. Cecilia was sentenced to 20 years. She was released after seven. She lived a quiet, uneventful life until she died in 1992. After the success of this story, Willie was promoted to being an associate publisher. He hated the position. He spent several years doing the business side of publishing and not writing very much, until he fired himself and went back to his old job as a writer for King Features Syndicate. But the fun was gone. He was itching to do something else. After several years of writing for Hearst, Willie befriended a young sheik in Katie's Café, Daoud Izeddin, who talked non-stop about his family in Arabia. He talked about the pashas riding camels in the desert, the ancient castles in the hills, and about the mystical whirling dervishes. These tales completely intrigued Willie. He and Katie made arrangements to visit Daoud's family, and they ended up spending a year there. Willie was in heaven. He got to ride with the Bedouins into battle. He slept under the desert stars at night. He got to study the altered states and living religion of the whirling dervishes, and got to visit ancient temples in the mountains. But mostly, he was vastly enamored by spending time in societies that were unchanged after a thousand years. He became friends with a desert pasha, who offered him the position of a minor sheikhship with command of a hundred horsemen. But Willie turned him down, and he and Katie went back to the United States. When he and Katie came back to New York, the public was clamoring for stories about Arabia. A few years earlier, tales about Lawrence of Arabia had electrified the public's interest in all things Arabian. Willie was invited to give a talk about his Arabian adventures at the Foreign Policy Association meeting. At the meeting, the publisher of the magazine Asia asked Willie for a six-part article. These articles led to a book contract. In 1927, Adventures in Arabia was published. It was a well-received book, and Willie was ecstatic that he had written his first real book. His early childhood dream of being a writer was coming true, and his future looked brighter than ever. His second book was about Haiti, called The Magic Island. But next, we're going to talk about his third book, Jungle Ways, and explore Willie's descent into cannibalism. Shortly after Willie's second book, The Magic Island, was published, he was invited to lunch in New York City by a man named Paul Morand. Paul was a writer and in the French diplomatic service. He was rich, famous, and had a lot of political influence in France. At lunch, Paul said that no matter what Willie was planning to do next, he simply had to go to West Africa. Paul had recently returned and said that the things that Willie had experienced in Haiti were nothing compared to what waited for him in West Africa. There were bigger voodoo temples, more elaborate jungle rituals and ceremonies, and stylized dancing that equaled the ballet russe. And he said all of this culture was dying out because of the colonial occupation and commercial exploitation. Of course, Paul mentioned that he knew about certain warrior tribes that still practiced traditional cannibalism and other tribes that still practiced ritual human sacrifice. He mentioned that all the African explorers knew about these tribes, but they were all too much in a hurry to fully appreciate the situation. Paul told Willie that he could provide names, places, and access to voodoo priests and witch doctors, and that he could help facilitate the trip then he said, you must see a human sacrifice, and you must eat human flesh. Unless you succeed in doing one or the other, or both if you can, I wouldn't write the book at all. Cannibal Warning So we are about to talk about cannibalism. We'll let you know when we're done. There will not be any graphic images about or vivid descriptions of cannibalism, so it won't be too bad. So Willie and Katie went to West Africa and spent a year there. 
he was introduced to the various warrior tribes, including the cannibal ones. He observed many esoteric rituals, like the juggler magicians who juggle children and masked fortune-telling witch doctors. And he spent months studying with various witch doctors in the jungle. And yet he couldn't seem to get into a cannibal feast. Until one day, the king of the cannibals, Mon Po, asked Willie for an aphrodisiac. The legend surrounding Willie at that time was that he was an accomplished witch doctor. The problem was that Mon Po was going to get married to another wife in an annual tradition. He already had 39 wives from previous traditions, and he was looking for some assistance. Now, Willie was in a bit of a spot, because if his medicine didn't work, then Mon Po would think that he'd been double-crossed, that Willie wasn't really a witch doctor. But if Willie was successful, he could ask Mon Po for a cannibal feast. So Willie made a potion that he had learned during his time in Haiti. The potion was made of rum, powdered shellfish, the sounds of drums, and a lot of singing. Well, the potion was successful, and so Willie asked to partake in the next cannibal feast, and Mon Po agreed. Willie didn't have to wait long. The feast happened after a local skirmish. Willie had seen the young enemy warrior killed in battle, but he wasn't allowed to see the preparation because of ritual reasons. Well, Willie figured out that the whole thing was a ruse when a drunken Mon Po offered him the hand as a delicacy. Willie could immediately tell that it was not the hand of a man, that it was the hand of an ape. So Willie realized that he was going to have to try something different. After the trip to Africa, Willie and Katie parted ways. Earlier, right before the trip, Willie had fallen in love with a woman named Marjorie, and Katie had fallen in love with Marjorie's husband. So after the trip, the four of them decided to do a permanent wife and husband swap. Willie and Marjorie went to France. Willie made arrangements with a friend, jean Guillaume Cosbrun, which is probably a made-up name, but Willie claimed he was a journalist who covered accidents for the local paper. Years later, Willie described his real experience with cannibalism in his autobiography, No Hiding Place, in one succinct paragraph. Marjorie, however, in her book, The Strange World of Willie Seabrook, devoted a very dramatic chapter to the whole experience. She was deeply disturbed by this experience. The arrangements that Willie had made with his complice were in Paris. He and Marjorie lived in Toulon, so they traveled to Paris and had to borrow the kitchen of a friend, Willie's French translator, Daniel Blanc. Willie told the cook that the meat was a wild African goat that had never been eaten before. So the cook offered to roast a piece, broil the next, and make a ragout with the remaining pieces. About that time, Daniel Blanc's vegetarian wife came home with a friend, and they seemed very intrigued with the exotic meat. Marjorie was horrified, and managed to convince everyone but Willie to not eat any of the dishes. Willie was delighted by the experience. He wrote five pages about the experience of eating human flesh, but he made sure that it was published in the chapter of his book about Africa. He said that it tasted like fully developed veal or fine young baby beef. So six months after Willie's book, Jungle Ways, was published, some French journalists came back from West Africa and wrote several articles mocking Willie and laughing about how he had been duped by the cannibal king and that he'd been served and eaten an ape instead of a human. Well, that's when Daisy Fellows enters this story. Daisy Fellows was an American heiress of the singer sewing machine Fortune who lived in Paris and was a friend of Willie's. The quote that best describes her is that she lived on grouse, cocaine, and other women's husbands. She was an extraordinary woman who was regularly voted one of the best-dressed women in the world. And she was once photographed wearing a hat that looked like a shoe. Some of her other claims to fame are that she was the 20th century's greatest collector of fine jewelry, and some say she had a color created for her called Shocking Pink. Also, her parties were legendary. When asked for advice about how to throw a good party, Daisy said, Just pour Benzedrine into the cocktails, darling. So one day, she and the actor Douglas Fairbanks Sr. visit Willie. 
She was quite sympathetic to his being ridiculed in the Parisian press about his cannibalism failure. So she said, I think you deserve to know what human flesh really tastes like. I'm going to give you a dinner party in my garden next week. Of course, Willie couldn't tell her that he'd already eaten human flesh from the Paris morgue, so he said nothing and looked forward to the event. The dinner party was, as usual for Daisy, marvelous. They had drinks that followed the recipe that Willie had learned from the white monk of Timbuktu, where Pernod and Amor Pecan, a bitter orange-flavored French aperitif, were mixed in equal parts. They sat in the garden at a table covered with white linen and silver and were served by an army of uniformed staff. When the dinner was over, Willie said that the grilled meat tasted like fully developed veal or fine young baby beef. It looked and tasted exactly like human flesh. He also said that nobody but Daisy Fellows knows what the real truth is about that cannibal feast. Whether or not it was human flesh and where she got it, no one knows. Willie's book Jungle Ways was a sensation, and he might have become known for his cannibalism if it hadn't been for his second book about his earlier trip to Haiti. Cannibal warning over. We now return to our regular presentation about zombies. And are we all unmuted now? Yes. Okay. I can hear you. Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. Great. Uh, I, I did not, there's just so much I did not uh, know in, that's encapsulated in that uh, 20 or so minutes. And uh, I, I, I had no idea the, the, the significance of the wow uh, as uh, uh, appears in the title. And there's <laughs> just, it's so... There's just so many different amazing aspects uh, to this guy's life from uh, <laughs> uh, from the occult side with uh, knowing Crowley to this whole painting of uh, uh, Crowley and graffiti on the side of a cliff and surviving <laughs> on the uh, handouts of uh, nice local farmers. Um, my goodness. <laughs> where where to begin? Um, I don't know if our if any of our uh, audience has any questions. You can uh, post them over on YouTube or the Facebook where we're streaming, and I I believe I can make them uh, appear magically. But um, uh, thank you so much for this uh, presentation, and I can't wait to see part two, which we'll be uh, premiering in two days, uh, Wednesday night after the seven to seven thirty weekly anomaly now news roundup show that I do with uh, Mark Jackson, but. I need a Victor. Um, this is just bizarre. I mean, I guess in some ways it's, it, it has the, 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 the ring of like, okay, again, the white privilege and, and uh, American uh, uh, rich guys going around the world. And what are they doing? Wasting their time trying to uh, find out what the, what, what human flesh tastes like. I mean, uh, most conspiracy theorists think they already know this cause they've been going to, to similar parties as this, but um uh, bins and dream field parties <laughs> specifically, but, um, I, whoa. So on the wow thing, I, I immediately am wondering if David Lynch, uh, got his wow, Bob, wow, uh, references, uh, then twin peaks. And I think other works of his from perhaps from this, uh, this amazing story of, of, uh, Willie and Crowley spending time, communicating through one word um and they did that for an entire week where they just talked using that one word and it drove willie's wife nuts no of course it would drive anybody nuts but i mean i i do think it is an altered state inducing type of uh, a scenario i mean the mantras uh, are often a part of um uh, attaining an altered state the the repetition the, uh, over and over again um and i, I actually i'm thinking of there's a uh uh, a famous uh, writer whose name eludes me at the moment, but a friend of mine turned me on to, uh, I believe it's a short story of his in which there's a chapter where it's called Dorky Day. And the the author, like, for, it's an annual ritual where for a full day, he just says, Dorky, 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 Dorky. <laughs> 
and people get, you know, like, and I, I imagine he could still try to communicate that through uh, inflection, but um, this guy, Will, you seems obviously obsessed with uh, altered states of consciousness oh, yeah, over, very much. over and over again. He, he, he was researching that. That's one of the side stories that we'll probably get into in a future episode. He spent a lot of time with the whirling dervishes and learning their methods of getting into altered states of consciousness. I, and I, yeah, when as soon as the whirling dervishes came up uh, in in your telling of this, I immediately was thinking about that very fact about that's such a, a important part of their spiritual tradition and and their way of. Uh, uh, inducing an altered state of consciousness. In fact, um, uh, one of the things that we have here in the, not uh, here, here, but uh, at the Anomaly Archives is uh, uh, the collection of a local past life regression uh, hypnotherapist, Rabia Lynn Clark, who produced a DVD called The Dervish Project because she uh, was a Sufi and, and um, was exploring that as uh, one of the modalities that interested her. But, um, there's just so much here uh, and love the touching on uh, Loch Ness, of course. Um, uh, the, the yellow journalism aspect obviously has so much uh, uh, to do with the current climate uh, in terms of quote unquote fake news. So there's, there's some modern uh, connections there. And again, go, going back to my uh, comments about uh, privilege and, and white adventurers, but uh, it also seems like he really did interact with a lot of, uh, of uh, women who were, really uh on on the front line of of what i guess we would ultimately call feminist uh full uh livelihood or, or you know being being individuals unto themselves and to the point where the i mean like you got to wonder about the, the 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 husband and wife swapping um on the other hand you know there's tons of uh, uh st stories and experience uh with uh folks uh, exploring that sort of uh, aspect for just for uh, you know lifestyle and sexuality reasons, but um, it sounds like the way you cached it, it from what your research is that it, it seemed more um, consensual and not some kind of uh, it, forced. It was permanent. Situation. They just said, "Hey, I like him. You like her. We <laughs> like each other. Let's just make this official." And they uh, <laughs> they they got divorced and remarried on the same day. Both couples. Wow. Well, so I, actually, um, uh, Seabrook and Marjorie got married um, about seven months later, but they oh, did okay. uh, live together for you know those seven months. Um, so got it. Well, we did have uh, this question from a viewer: Do any of you see any metaphoric connections between H.G. Wells' wandering disease in things to come and the whole subject of zombieism? Uh, different. Uh, kind of a field from where we're at, but um, not sure how familiar y'all are. Um, I, I, I don't, I've I just got the Blu-ray of uh, Things to Come the other day, but I haven't watched it yet. Uh, it was uh, I, it was part of a, a Harryhausen uh, where he, uh, Harryhausen restored the movie She by H. Ryder Haggard in full color, and that was the second feature on it. I, I haven't I'm, watched it yet. Well, we should organize a watch party, uh, socially distanced, of course, <laughs> or uh, watch it together over some streaming. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not familiar enough to answer that question myself, uh, Jim, but thank you for your question. Uh, and another viewer uh, says, good show, guys. Really appreciate that, John. Thank you so much. Um, this is, again, part one of a two-parter. And so I, I started to say at the beginning of the show that back in February when uh, – we first launched this monthly series and it was supposed to be an in-person series at our wonderful facility downtown uh, at 55 North IH35, the frontage road and the uh, corner of the frontage road and, and Lambie streets. Uh, we've, we've got a great presentation space there and uh, Victor and I need did a great presentation that you can watch on our archived uh, YouTube channel. Uh, our archives there that uh, for their first presentation, which, um, I highly recommend, and they've been doing them since. But at the end of that uh, presentation was when they had promised uh, uh, the next the next presentation was going to be on zombies, and so that would have been our March presentation. But 
here we are, and uh, the world uh, <laughs> continues to change before our very eyes. And uh, but you know, I'm so glad that we waited because we got this great presentation, and I can't wait to see more. And like uh, Victor was saying, uh, there's stuff that they've had to edit out of these two parts uh, just to kind of put it into a more concise uh, 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 storytelling uh, framework. And we uh, are going to replay both of these uh, 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 part one and part two as part of the thing that we've just recently announced this uh, emergency fundraiser streamathon that the Anomaly Archives is going to be doing very soon. Uh, we'll have details to come at our website anomalyarchives.org and um, I just there's just so much craziness in this story. Um, I, I, so the, 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 to the best of your knowledge from from what and I think what you said was that the, he had uh, uh, obtained the meat that he allegedly ate that was allegedly human flesh from his contact at the Paris morgue. So I wonder how fresh that could have been. Uh. <laughs> well, he did write five pages about his experience um, uh, eating it, but I, I chose not to read all five pages because it's fairly um, in depth. And um, so I'm going to, but I will answer your question. It was very fresh. <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll leave it at that. <laughs> okay. No, and I appreciate the, the trigger warning there, uh, you know. And I remember as I was creating the stream for tonight, I'm clicking the, the YouTube button that says not for kids, uh, assuming that, uh, you know, anything discussing cannibalism or even just not zombies. Though it's funny. I mean, that's one of the weird things that when you think about this, the the, the mythos and milieu of or the trope of, of zombies is it has become so mainstream. And of course I know there's plenty of people uh, religious or otherwise who feel that this is part of that desensitization that's, that's happened uh, for uh, across so many aspects of our society. And, and I certainly think there's a little bit of something to that, not to say that there's uh, any actual uh, conspiracy to, to, to bring about such a desensitization, but I think it's kind of the, the a natural process, so to speak of, of humans inquisitiveness and um, uh, as we you know reach uh, out in search of answers uh, as clearly Willie was uh, a seeker of experience and and knowledge and um, you know what really what drove his desire for these uh, altered states of consciousness I wonder uh, was it you know so many times you you hear about people who've had uh, tra traumatic childhoods or some kind of abuse or um, you know, there's there's a lot of things that drive people to towards these ex times these types of extreme experience, but um, uh, uh, I'll have to we'll have to get the skinny on that from y'all. In in his autobiography, he he's pretty clear about that it was the time that he spent with Piney in the woods, where when she was on her laudanum highs and she would have fantastical visions, she had the ability to project those visions into his mind and he would go on mental trips with her seeing the imagery that she was seeing and eventually at one point he saw his own vision separate from what she was seeing is the way he described it and that was when he knew that that was going to be one of the big things in his life interesting yeah and uh you know there's so many uh, ideas about Follet do the uh, uh, hallucination experience by two or more, and this idea actually quite common in in uh, psychedelic drug culture that uh, certain drugs seem to allow us to tune into these other realities, uh, these other perceptions, often witnessing the same quote unquote hallucinations uh, that uh, others are witnessing while on the drug. But of course, as y'all pointed out, he claimed that he she never gave him. Uh, any um, <laughs> opium or laudanum or what have you. Um, but that's, that's well, a fascinating well, idea, this idea of, of him tapping into her visions as well. What was that idea? Oh, well, one of, one of the things we learned about um, Willie is he is a bit of an unreliable uh, narrator. <laughs> and so we don't always know exactly where the line is drawn. Because when we read his, his autobiography, it was like, oh, she totally gave him opium. <laughs> but then he <laughs> swears that she didn't. And it's kind of like, well, you know, he still had family members alive at the time that his book came out. And so... I uh, prefer to think that she probably did um, give him opium, but that's just, you know, pure speculation on my, or that's, that's me reading uh, uh, in between the lines, shall we say. 
So. And you know, and that that's an important uh, thing to to bear in mind with anybody's biography or autobiography, and and, and uh, you know how how much the 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 ac accuracy of a uh, uh, of an experience or a story it gets trans uh, gets censored self censored by that person because of the people still living, um, and you know you hear about those kinds of things uh, quite regularly. So, um, the well, and research the into doing research into Willie is difficult because when he tells true stories, he changes people's names, you know, like the, the reporter in Paris who gave him the, the tip on when the fresh meat was in the morgue. You know, he uses a name that doesn't exist. That name isn't, you, you can't find that name anywhere in any newspaper search or anything. And Willie does that a lot with people and there's no way to find who the real people were in some of these stories that he tells. Yep. Yep. You know, you got to, got to protect your anonymous sources, especially when they're breaking the law. Uh, 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 I'm assuming it was illegal to eat human flesh in Paris at the time. Um, and the steal body parts from the morgue. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I mean, again, I, the, you know, uh, assuming, uh, Assuming it wasn't just a, J a John Doe, or I guess what would the uh, the French version of that be? Uh, Jacques. <laughs> Jacques. So, <laughs> assuming it wasn't, uh, you know, the, hey, everybody's got you know family and and uh, parents, and I'm sure they would not appreciate learning uh, that their son or daughter had been brutalized well, in, in um, death. Marjorie had a, an interesting thing to say about um, her take on the experience, and she said, you know, she mentioned that cadavers had been used uh, in scientific experiments, and that this was a literary exper uh, experiment, and so that, you know, the, the person being defiled uh, will live forever in, um, in literature. So, you know, I think she was really trying to spin it. <laughs> yeah, indeed. Um... Just also a uh, quick aside, I just love the uh, the Daisy uh, person uh, who, with her shoe hat, which of course uh, immediately for many of our friends and fans, uh, I'm sure are familiar with the wonderful Ter Terry Gilliam film, Brazil, which features uh, one of the characters wearing a hat that's a, that's a shoe, I, for what yeah, that's worth. It does. It was inspired by the same shoe. <laughs> the shoe hat was designed by, I can't remember her name. Right off the show. Oh, oh uh, uh, Elsa Schiaparelli. Oh, okay. I was yeah, the that's... fashion designer, but she got it from um, from Salvador Dali, uh, drew the, the imagery, and then um, uh, uh, Schiaparelli uh, made it into a fashion event. And, and so you'll find several women wearing that shoe um, when you do a search on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, um, I, I, I think we uh, have uh, had a great time tonight. Thank you so much. And um, I really appreciate uh, the folks who, who turned out for tonight's episode. Of course, this will be archived uh, on the Anomaly Archives YouTube channel. And as I mentioned, um, our weekly uh, news roundup from 7 to 7.30 will be happening Wednesday night, and right after that we'll be having uh, Victor and Ainita back on for part two of, of this amazing, crazy, crazy story, and uh, we'll hear even more about the, the history of zombies. So uh, thank you all for joining us, and uh, good night. Good night.